Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, good morning. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Doug Crawford. Um, Doug uh, is from Yahoo, and he is the inventor of JSON, and he also has discovered all the good parts in JavaScript. Can you believe that? <laughs> well, it's uh, it's great that um, Doug, you know, graciously offered to talk about two uh, basic offering two talks in this one uh, one half an hour slot, uh, talking about both the, the JSON saga and the web of confusion. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Good morning, man. It's great to be here on Tropical Redmond. <laughs> so as Helen said, I have two talks for you this morning. The JSON saga, which is the history of the JSON data interchange format, and Web of Confusion, which is a security talk about what it is that the web got right that everybody else continues to get wrong. I'm going to start with the, the JSON thing. There's a lot to, to talk about. so get started. Uh, but one word of warning, I am a heretic. So if you're offended by heresy, you should leave now. Um, so I discovered Jason. I do not claim to have invented Jason. I think Jason already existed in nature. I just found it and gave it a name and showed how to exploit it. I don't claim to be the first to have discovered it. Um, I, my discovery was in 2001. I know that there are people in 2000 who were using something very much like JSON. The earliest use I found of someone using JavaScript to deliver data was at Netscape in 1996. So this is an idea that's been around for a while. I don't claim it to be original to me. What I did was I gave it a specification and a little website. And everything else happened literally by itself. I, I can't claim credit for very much in this saga. Um, the story for me starts in 2001. I formed a company with Chip Morningstar to develop what today would be called Ajax and Comet uh, application uh, frameworks. Uh, we weren't able to decide what the name of the company was, so we thought temporarily we would call it Veil. And then later, when we were ready to go public, we would unveil the company and, and show people the true name. So I went ahead and, and created this logo for Veil knowing that it was going to be a throwaway thing. And I really liked it. And I was kind of sad that we had to throw it away, because I think it's a really nice logo design. What we ended up being called was Date Software. Uh, we hired an advertising agency, which gave us this pair of frisky paramecians. <laughs> and the negative space in between them is sort of a letter S. So that was supposed to be iconic of the company. That, we did that in 2002. But the very first JSON message was transmitted in April of 2001 in Chip's garage from his uh, server, which was, I think, an old sunbox or something, and my laptop. And you can see the JSON message there in green. Um, our application platform was based on distributed objects. And so uh, we would send messages to objects across the network. In this case, we were sending the message to the session object, and we were sending it a test message. We weren't aware at the time that we were making history, so we didn't do anything as momentous as what hath God wrought, or <laughs> Mr. Watson, come here, I need you. It's just hello world. Um, and in this particular, uh, the envelope that we used for this first message was an HTML document, which was sent in response to a form submit post uh, to a frame, a, a subframe within the document. Uh, we did it that way because uh, it worked on Netscape 4. And there are a lot of web developers in the world today who hate IE6. But at that time in history, IE6 was far and away the best web browser the world had ever seen. Um, and Netscape 4 was not. It, it was a crime against humanity, a really bad, bad web browser. But there were a number of technologically backward companies that insisted all of their employees use it. And some of those companies were companies we were hoping to do business with, including uh, Sun Microsystems and IBM. So we felt it was important to support Netscape, and this is the way that we did it. Um, so that HTML document delivered a script. First thing the script did was um, get around the same origin policy. And the second thing it did was call the receive method on the se session object in the parent frame, passing the JSON object as the data. 
And that worked really well, or at least it, it was supposed to have worked well. But that first message failed. Um, and it took us a while to figure out why. The reason it failed was do is a reserved word in JavaScript. And so this generated a syntax error. And it uh, took some reading of the specification to figure out why. It turns out that uh, ECMAScript 3, which is the standard for JavaScript, has a WAC reserved word policy. Um, reserved words in the key position of an object literal have to be quoted, even though there's no good reason for that to occur. Um, later, when I got around to trying to specify JSON as a standard, I was trying to do two things. One, I was trying to convince people that JavaScript was a language you could use for application development. Um, so I did not want to say, and by the way, here's something really stupid about JavaScript, which should cause you to be really suspicious of it. So I didn't want to put the reserved word list into the JSON spec. So I decided instead, let's just quote the words. That way, no one will ever have to know. Uh, it had a side effect of significantly simplifying the, the JSON spec. It turns out if you have names, you have to declare what a letter is. And in the Unicode world, a letter is a really complicated idea. And by saying we don't have letters, we just have strings, we avoided all of that. <clears throat> and that was a great simplification. Another benefit was it conformed more closely to a syntax that was already built into Python. Python has things that look very much like object literals, but the keys have to be quoted. And we were hoping to make friends in the Python world, so that seemed a, a good justification too. The next problem we found was that if um, we had a string which contained something which looked like HTML um, in, in this envelope, um, it wouldn't get delivered properly. In this case, we've got a, something that looks like a closed script tag. It isn't. It's a string literal within a JSON message within a piece of JavaScript, but the browser thinks that ends the script block, and so that causes another syntax error. So then we um, amended the JSON grammar to tolerate a backslash in front of a slash within a string so that we could get things through this, um, this HTML deal. Um, we decided to give this language a name, and the first name we gave it was Jismal, rhymes with dismal. It stood for JavaScript message language. But it turned out there was already in the Java world a Jismal standard, the Java speech markup language, something no, one, no one's ever heard of. But there was already this thing, and we didn't want to have confusion around it, so we thought about another name, and we finally came up with JSON, the JavaScript object notation. Um, we found that JSON was really useful. I mean, it was obviously useful for doing the browser-server communication. As you just saw, there's virtually no work required on the client in order to use this language. Or that's an extremely desirable feature. Uh, we also found it was really effective in uh, inter-server communication, applications where JavaScript was not involved at all. We had a highly scalable um, session architecture. Um, we had lots of machines that could talk to each other, and we kept them all in sync by sending JSON messages, and it was really effective for that. We also used JSON uh, for persistence. We had a, a JSON database, which was really easy to implement, really easy to use. We were really happy about JSON, and we wanted to tell all of our customers about it and recommend they get on it too. And they said things like, well, we hate it because we've never heard of it. Uh, some of them said, oh, I wish you'd talked to us six months ago because we just committed to XML and we just can't consider anything else right now. Um, and there were some people we talked to who said, it's not a standard. And we said, yes, it is. It's a proper subset of ECMA 262. They said, that's not a standard. So I decided, OK, I'm um, going to have to declare it a standard. So I went into the standards business. I bought JSON.org. I put up a one-page website that described JSON including the grammar specified three ways as a simplified BNF using a notation that um, uh, uh, McKeeman of Dartmouth recommended to me, uh, railroad diagrams, and informal English. I also included a Java reference implementation just so that people could see how easy it was to write one of these things. Um, and then I retired. Um, it turned out uh, we ran out of money 2001 and 2002, right after the, the internet bubble popped and right after 9-11, was a brutally difficult time to be trying to raise venture capital. Um, so I decided to give up software for a while. Um, I went, into, went back into consumer electronics. I was doing um, consulting on HDTV and the digital TV transition you know, until I waited for Silicon Valley to get its act back together again. Um, 
And that's all I did. So for the next uh, couple of years, I did absolutely nothing to try to promote Jason. I wasn't going to conferences. I wasn't blogging. I wasn't Twittering. I, I wasn't speaking about it. I wasn't publishing about it. I just had this little web page out there. I put a message format in a bottle and set it adrift in the internet. And people found it. People started coming to the site and saying, yeah, that's exactly what I need, and, and started building stuff with it. And after a while, they started sending stuff back. Um, Contributors started sending me translations of, of a thing to run on, on Perl or Ruby or Python. Lots of languages were suddenly getting JSON support. Uh, one of the advantages of having a specification as simple as the JSON specification was that it was not much work for anybody to adapt it for another language. And so over time, we got support for all of these languages. This is a pretty impressive list. I think virtually everything that anybody is writing today is on this list. Um, so you can communicate data between any pair of programs written in any of these languages, and it'll work. That, that's an amazing thing. Um, and the reason it works is because JSON is at the intersection of all programming languages. Something all languages have in common is a understanding of a set of simple values, generally numbers, strings, and booleans, some kind of sequence of values, um, which is an array or a vector or a list. It's different in different languages, but every language has some notion of one of those things. And some collection of named values, and it, that might be called an object or a record or a struct or a hash or a property list. Again, every language does this differently, but they all have something like this. And JSON talks to that common bit of all of the languages. There have been other attempts at, at data interchange which tried to be the union of all the languages, and that turns out to be extremely complicated. But by going for the intersection, JSON's actually really, really easy. Um, this is an example of, or a, a snippet from an implementation of a JSON parser uh, using a recursive descent. Um, it's a really easy technique to parse JSON, very effective. Um, this is an example using a state machine, uh, a push down finite automaton. Most of the work is done in the statement that's in green, where we go to a table and look up um, using the current state and the current token, get a function, execute that function that causes some action to occur and transitions to the next state. JavaScript turns out to be a brilliant language for writing state machines, because you can put your functions right in the state transition tables. So it, it's really, really clean. The way most people use JSON and JavaScript today is through the JSON2 library which uses eval, which gives you access to JavaScript's own compiler to uh, parse the JSON text. The problem with that is that um, if the JSON text isn't actually JSON text, then you're exposing yourself to some security dilemma. So um, JSON2 first runs your text through four regular expressions in order to verify that nothing bad's going to happen if it goes to eval. Originally it was one, and some stuff got through, and then it was two, and stuff. It was, Regular expressions are a lousy medium to use for, for validating anything. Um, but that works. But fortunately, uh, good news is that the next edition of ECMAScript, uh, the fifth edition, the first new edition in 10 years, will have built-in uh, JSON support. So um, you'll be able to, to parse uh, natively. It'll be really, really fast and much more reliable. Really, really good stuff. It's available today, now, everywhere in better browsers and soon it will be available in all of them. One of the benefits of having the description of the standard be so simple is it's not a lot of work for anybody to translate it. Um, and I was very, very happy to have wonderful people from all over the world um, submit um, translations of the page. So that description is now available to people in all these languages, which is just wonderful. I love this. If it turns out that you're fluent in a language which isn't on this list and you'd like to help out, uh, please uh, help out. Um, so the big thing that made Jason, put Jason on the map was Ajax. Jesse James Garrett discovered in 2005 what a lot of other people had discovered in 2000, which was that you can use browsers for doing applications and not using page replacement as the primitive by which people can interact with a, an application. Um, it, nobody was interested in that in 2000, but in 2005 it was really, really hot. Um, and a lot of web developers discovered that it was a lot easier to do that using JSON than using XML. Now, there were some cranks at the time who said, 
Oh, you can't use JSON because Jesse James Garrett said the X stands for, AJ, or for XML and that's what you have to use. That didn't last very long. So uh, the, the smarter web developers got onto JSON pretty quickly. Um, uh, when I saw what people were actually doing with, uh, with it, I was a little bit alarmed. I, I saw some things like um, using comments to send meta instructions to the parsers, which meant that interoperability was not going to work because everybody would be dependent on stuff which was not specified and, and uncontrollable. So um, I changed the, the, uh, the standard. I removed the comments uh, to uh, frustrate those dangerous practices. It also turned out to produce a lot of unnecessary complexity. Um, in looking at some of the ports of the JSON parser in other languages, about half of their work was just getting the comments working. Um, and that seemed completely unnecessary. So by removing the comments, it made it even easier to port JSON to other languages. It also provided alignment with uh, YML, which is another data interchange format, which stands for something funny. And the YML community coincidentally created a language which was a superset of JSON. It, um, it had JSON as a subset, except that they didn't have C-style comments as JSON did. So by removing the comments, it aligned JSON closer to YML or to uh, YAML, um, so that um, it could be a proper subset. What is YAML? I don't know. Uh, yet another markup language, something like that. Um, then the, the last thing I changed was adding scientific notation to numbers. Um, at State Software, we were doing business applications, and scientific just didn't occur to us that there was a need for it. But as Ajax became more popular, the, uh, the need appeared, and so that was the last change I made, and sort of sealed the door to any further changes at that point, because I didn't put any kind of version number on the thing. So now that uh, it's at large scale, there's no way to say, and here is a syntactic variant, um, and have people adapt to it. There's no way to do that, and that was intentional. So as a consequence of that, JSON will not be changed. Because if there was a version number on it, then you know, if, if it was JSON 1.0, then you know there's going to be a 1.1, and there's going to be a 2.0, and everything's crap until it's 3.0. <laughs> I didn't want to go through that. I just say, it's done. Um, and maybe someday it will be replaced by something better or bigger or more complete. Um, but it will never change. Uh, so you can, if you're using JSON, you can be confident that there's at least one layer of the stack that's not going to shift out from under you. And I, I, I think that offers a much greater advantage than any change we could put into it. Um, one of the principal goals of the design of JSON was minimalism. Um, minimalism is way undervalued in, in standard setting. And it turned out that the design of JSON is so simple that it can fit on the back of a business card. That's literally true. This is the card. This is the back. It's there. If, if you want a copy of the card, uh, come see me after. I'd be happy to give you one. Now, I'm not saying that every standard should fit on the back of a business card, but I, I think it's a nice thing for a standards body to at least contemplate or, or maybe be slightly desirous of, because it's really easy to make a standard bigger. It's really hard to make a standard better. And minimalism, I think, is, is one of the paths to doing that. Also, the less we have to agree on in order to interoperate, the more likely we're going to be able to interoperate well. So minimalism is the way to get to the simplicity that we need. Um, there are a lot of influences on the design of JSON. I'd like to go through some of those. The most important, the granddaddy of them all, was LISP, John McCarthy's uh, AI language uh, from 1958 at MIT. LISP was based on a, graphic, on a textual notation for simple binary trees. And they used those binary trees to represent data, and they also used um, those expressions to represent programs. It was very clever the way they, they did the two at the same time. Very, very powerful uh, notation. There are many people who said, we should be using S expressions for data interchange, which would have been a good idea. Um, generally, the, the marketplace rejected S expressions for the same reason it rejected Lisp, which was it's just too wacky looking. Um, there's virtually no syntax there at all. It's just neep, deeply nested sets of parentheses. Um, and 
the LISP community says that's absolutely the right way to do it, and everybody else says get away from me with that, with all those parentheses. Um, the world likes syntax, and so um, that didn't happen. So it's unfortunate because the world should be writing in LISP or in Scheme and, and those languages. They're really good languages because there are really important ideas there. And it turns out the most important of those ideas is uh, Lambda, first functions as first class values. And the first language to go mainstream with that was JavaScript, which is an amazing thing. Um, another language that influenced Jason was Rebel, Carl Sassenrath's uh, little scripting language, which is also based on an idea of um, uh, a data representation language, which is also executable. Um, Rebel is brilliant. It has much richer syntax and a, an extremely rich set of types. Um, really nice little language. It deserves a lot more attention than it's currently getting. Um, obviously, uh, Jason was influenced by JavaScript because Jason is JavaScript. I seem to have made a career out of mining good stuff out of JavaScript. Um, Jason is, is one of those things. I wrote this pamphlet, JavaScript, the good parts, which is more of that. It's not accidental that there's all this good stuff in JavaScript. The guy who designed the language, Brendan Eich, brilliant guy. And this stuff was put in there intentionally. It's just a lot of bad stuff got in there, too. Um, coincidentally, um, the JSON notation, you know, the, the idea of uh, nested structures made up of uh, curly braces and colons and brackets, occurred simultaneously in JavaScript, Python, and NewtonScript. Um, all these languages were designed around the same time. None of these designers were in communication with each other. This was just a spontaneous invention, the same notation showing up three places. Uh, and I, I think that indicates that there was something natural, maybe an inevitable, about this notation. That looking at sort of the C style of, of how you do syntactic forms and then applying that to data, this is the natural way to represent data in programming languages. Um, and there were even earlier instances of this stuff. For example, at Next, the uh, OpenStep system had property lists, which were basically JSON structures. The syntax was slightly different. They were using uh, colon or semicolons instead of commas, and they were using colons instead of equal signs. But they had this idea. They had it, and they had it right. Um, and that was in 93. So again, I, I, I present this as evidence that this is a natural sort of thing that's been bouncing around um, in the cosmos for quite a while now. Uh, then XML was um, a consideration, not, not in terms of what it did, but about how it got standardized. Um, XML is a lousy document format. Um, and the world rejected it back when it was called SGML. When it was transformed in, into XML, they didn't repair any of the things that were really crappy about SGML. Uh, they just changed some other things and, and gave it a new name. And I'll offer as evidence that it's a crappy document format um, that XHTML is a total failure. If XML were the right way to, to mark up documents, XHTML should have beat HTML into the ground, and it didn't. It, it's just dying. Um, so XML is not a good document format. I'll, later I'll show you a better format. Um, and it's an even worse as a data format. Um, so what was interesting about XML was how did this turkey become so popular? What, what was the mechanism by which that happened? And I think the answer, for the answer to that, you have to look at what happened with HTML. When HTML first emerged, there were a lot of A-list CTOs and technologists who looked at it and said, well, this is so obviously deficient. This isn't going to go mainstream because it's got all of these problems. But there were enough B-level and C-level guys who got really excited about it to get the avalanche going that um, it went mainstream anyway. So a lot of those A-list guys thought they were wrong, but they weren't wrong. Everything that they identified as deficient in HTML is actually deficient, and we're all struggling with that today. We've been struggling with it from the very beginning, and it has not gotten any better since day one. Um, so, um, but they thought they were wrong because they asked the wrong question. So they should ask not if it's good enough, they should ask is it going to be popular enough. And so when a new system came out from the same people who brought you HTML, which also had angle brackets, um, nobody was going to oppose it. And so it went mainstream. Um, John Seeley Brown was uh, running uh, Xerox PARC, one of the most brilliant research operations in the history of the universe, where they developed uh, 
graphical user interfaces and object-oriented programming and local area networking and laser printing, just all the stuff that we do today came out of there. Seeley Brown, John Seeley Brown oversaw all that stuff, brilliant guy. I saw him talk at the CTO forum in San Francisco in April of 2002, and he was talking about a, a new world in which you have loosely coupled systems and XML is the thing that would bind them all together. And he said of XML, maybe only something this simple could work. A couple of months later, I was attending another conference, uh, listening to a speaker who was a little closer to the ground talking about XML, and he said, maybe only something this complicated could work. And it really impressed me that how did this go from something so, so simple to so complicated? How did that happen so fast? Um, and I think the reason was that it just doesn't fit. Its model for how you do data is just the wrong model, and so it introduces so much noise and so much difficulty and complexity that it took something that should have been simple and turned it into something that was really hard. Um, and there were a number of people at the time who recognized this. For example, there were websites out there such as xmlsucks.org. Um, this particular site, the premise was why XML is technologically terrible, but you have to use it anyway. So basically, there were two schools of thought on XML. One was that it was perfection. This is the thing we've always been waiting for, the inevitable uh, result of evolution. Um, and the other school, which said that it wasn't, but one thing that they could both agree on was that it was the standard, so shut up. Shut up! That was, um, shut up. Uh, not everybody shut up. There were a bunch of crackpots out there who recognized that there were obviously things wrong with XML and proposed to fix it. And so you got each of these crackpots came up with their own idea and a guy named Paul T collected them all on a page. And I'm sure there were lots of others there that he didn't collect. Uh, Paul was doing this because his was one of them and he was hoping that by calling attention to everybody is that he would get more attention for himself. So every one of these designers probably had a good idea. They all shared an idea of what was wrong with the thing, and they all had their own idea about how to fix it. It was unlikely that any of them, any one of them would have said, oh, that other guy, he, he did something as good as or better than mine, so I'll drop mine and, and embrace his. So they, none of them were going to do that. So it was just a lot of noise, and there was no way for any one of them to rise to the top, um, except that um, one of them worked really well with Ajax, and that wasn't a coincidence, it, or it wasn't accidental, it was intentional. It was designed specifically to work well with Ajax. Um, so that caused Jason to float to the top, and Jason won out of this set, and eventually went on and, and displaced XML in a, in a very large, ever-growing set of applications. So the XML community was not real happy about that. Um, they, they were, had, entered as a disruptive technology, and now they were being disrupted themselves, and they didn't like it. Um, and um, at first, the, uh, the response was disdain. You know, you can't do that. It's the standard, shut up. Why aren't you shutting up? Um, after that, they started making threats. And at first, it was more like sputtering, like, you'll rue the day you ever question the technical superiority of XML, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but it's kind of vague. You know why you would be doing that ruining sometime in the future. Um, then the threat started getting more specific. As Ajax started growing, uh, they were forced to admit that, okay, it, it works all right with your little web apps, but if you're doing big manly applications, you need the complexity in XML. If you don't have, that complexity is there for a reason. It's there to help you, and if you don't have it, you will fail. And again, they couldn't articulate why it was going to fail, but they were pretty emphatic that you had to watch out for this. Well, since then, manly applications have been developed in, in JSON, and they don't fail. They just get faster. So ultimately, they were reduced to death threats, literally death threats. For example, uh, Dave Weiner, a couple days before Christmas in 2006, said, it's not even XML. Who did this travesty? Let's find a tree and string them up now. And what an ugly thing to say. Fortunately, nobody listens to Dave Weiner. <laughs> um, James Clark, who was one of the principal architects of, of XML a couple months later, said, any damn fool could produce a better data format than XML, which it turns out is true. <laughs> so um, somehow in the whole XML insanity, 
we forgot the first rule of good workmanship, which is use the right tool for the right job. Instead, we got obsessed with this one tool to rule them all. In any sense of good engineering, where you're trying to pick the best tools, the best methods, the me best materials, went out the window. Um, so it, if the only benefit of Jason was that this idea became popular again, then that's a really good thing. So I'm not claiming that Jason is the only tool that you should use for everything. What I am suggesting is that Jason is really good at a bunch of things. And if you're doing one of those things, you would do well to get onto Jason. Um, so that, that caused me to wonder, where did the idea come from that data should be represented by a document format? I mean, in retrospect, that seems a completely nutty idea. Um, so where did it come from? So going back in time, uh, yeah? Do you have a simple description of the difference between data and a document? Yeah, data is stuff that programming languages like. So is there anything that XML is good for? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> um, so let, let me run through this. Okay, so going back in history, um, one of the very first uh, text processing programs was something called Runoff. It, this ran back on the old mainframes. In some cases, each line of text would be on a punch card. Um, in some of the older versions, um, the text would have all been in uppercase with special markup to indicate which character should be set in lowercase. Um, and so you can see um, a line that starts with a letter is text and will get filled into a paragraph. And the lines that start with a period are some kind of control. Um, in this case, SK means skip a line, and TB4 means tab over four spaces. Um, so it's kind of brutal, machine-oriented markup. Uh, Charles Goldfarb of, of IBM thought he could do better, and so he came up with his generalized ML. Um, and this shows one stage of the evolution of that language. Um, he now has a colon in, in column one. And by, having, by ending the tag or the command with a period, he's able now to put text on the same line as the commands. Um, any of you who are familiar with HTML will recognize those, a lot of those tags. They're eerily familiar, um, except for the EOL thing. And you can probably guess what that represents. So as he went through his evolution from GML to SGML, you can see we had this progression. Um, and then finally ended up with angle brackets. And in a moment, I'll show you where the angle brackets came from. Um, in 1980, Brian Reed, I think he was at Carnegie Mellon, published um, Scribe, which was what he called a document compiler. And it had a, it, this was the first instance of getting the separation between document structure and and presentation right. Uh, Reed got this right in 1980. And he also had a really, really nice notation for how you describe documents. Um, he only had one reserved character in the language, and that was the at sign. If you wanted a literal at sign, you just had two of them. If the at sign was followed by a word, then that would indicate a tag of some sort, which could have a beginning quote and an ending quote. Um, and then you have stuff inside of it which is affected by that environment. And he had um, six sets of characters that you could use for those quoting, so that if you're doing stuff which is deeply nested, um, you can avoid the lisp problem of having too many parentheses and that become difficult to match. This notation was uh, extremely easy to match and to avoid um, the use of special characters in cases where you want literal characters. He also had a long form where you had the word begin and then the name of a tag, and then everything up until the end matching tag uh, is included in that, which was really nice for doing very long things like chapters or tables, you know, very complex structures. Really, really nice. Goldfarb saw the angle brackets and go, oh, yeah. Uh, he'd never thought to use those, but um, clearly they had a, a very big impression on him. Um, but um, I, I can tell you from experience, this is much easier to write correctly than, than SGML or XML or HTML. The, the reason why XHTML failed was web developers just can't write HTML and get it right. Um, so you need some resiliency in it. Um, having a, a system which totally fails if, if um, you don't get the markup right, just the, the market has no tolerance for that. But getting back to where the data come from, one of the things that Reed had inscribed was a way to describe entries for the bibliography. Um, 
here is an example of a tech report in a book. And it looks like JSON, doesn't it? And you've got name value pair separated by commas. Um, this is in a document, and it's describing a document, but it is data. Uh, Goldfarb um, picked up on some of this, and this is where attributes came from that we got into HTML. Unfortunately, he didn't pull in the whole scribe thing. And it's really unfortunate that Tim Berners-Lee wasn't more aware of document formats. If he had picked scribe instead of SGML as the basis for his World Wide Web, the World Wide Web would be a much better place today. But this is where the idea first occurred of putting data in a document. And this idea moved into the SGML community and eventually into the uh, XML community. Um, when I um, published the reference implementation of the JSON library, I needed a license to, to publish it under. Um, and I looked at a lot of licenses and I decided I liked the MIT license because it was not restrictive. It just says, um, leave this notice in the source code and don't sue me. Uh, otherwise, you can do pretty much anything you want, which is really nice. But this was just after 9-11, okay, when we were uh, starting on the war of terror and I was worried, well, if I open this stuff up, what if Osama bin Laden were to use my software? <laughs> I'd feel really bad about that. Because uh, the president said we're going after the evildoers, and I thought that was a good thing. So I added this line to the MIT license. Uh, the software shall be used for good, not evil. About, and it's worked really well, so I now put this on everything I write. Um, some of the... Well, yeah, so about once a year I get a letter from a crank who says, um, how can I know if what I'm doing is good or evil? <laughs> and I said, well, you shouldn't be using my software. <laughs> um, and, and it works. You know, that, you know I, I know that evildoers say, I, I will not use your software until you fix the license. Great, it's working. <laughs> About once a year, I, I'll, I get a, a letter from an attorney at um, a famous company. I don't want to embarrass them, so I'll just say their initials, IBM. <laughs> <laughs> where they've got some project that wants to use something that I wrote and they need special permission, you know, that we don't intend to do evil, but, you know, we, we can't speak about our customers and everything. Um, in fact, this literally happened two weeks ago. Uh, so I sent them back this message. I said, I give permission to IBM, its customers, partners, and minions to use JS Lint for evil. And he wrote back, thanks very much, Douglas. Uh, so finally, let me conclude uh, with the JSON logo. When I put up that web page, I decided I need a logo on this page in order to make it look, you know, more credible. Um, and so I came up with this thing. And what is that? It's based on a famous optical illusion called the impossible torus, which is closely related to another famous illusion called the ambihelical hex nut. Um, so what I did was I took the impossible torus and I rounded it out and realigned it and gave it some interesting shading. Um, but it, it's still topologically the same figure. Um, I, I liked a lot of things about it. One was if you look at it two-dimensionally, it is two symmetrical pieces which just clip together to form this, this O-shaped thing. Um, and so that kind of suggested the two sides of a conversation going around and around, you know, which is what Jason was invented for, designed for, discovered for. Um, it also seemed to have some letter forms in it, like I could see a letter J kind of in there, um, and the O obviously, and maybe an N, so it, it almost spelled out the name of the thing that it was describing. Anytime you have two curves, you can kind of pretend there's an S in it. Um, but after looking at this for a couple of years, I made an amazing discovery. It's not impossible. You take a square and you extrude it in a circle, okay? And then as it orbits, have it do one revolution and it makes this. So it's a square and a circle with a twist. It's not impossible, it's actually a simple figure. I think this is a wonderful metaphor, a wonderful symbol for Jason. I'm really happy about that. Um, so once I figured out what it was, it was easy to write a mathematical model of it and, and do it in software. So this is a version written in JavaScript using a canvas um, and some really extreme lighting that I did for a t-shirt design. Um, so it's nice now that web browsers have gotten good enough to generate their own logos. Um, this is one that I did 
um, for this business card, trying to do something that looked like it was around for 100 years. You know, the data interchange format mothers have learned to love over many generations. Then finally, this is the last thing. Um, <laughs> this one was uh, inspired by Shepard Ferry's uh, Obama poster. Um, I call it data interchange we can believe in. <laughs> All right, so should we do questions or move on to the next one? Um, we can do some questions. Okay, yeah. Um, so if I implement a new implementation for another language, is there some kind of standard set of regression test that you could run to show that my thing actually works? Uh, no, there, there, there is a set of tests available on the JSON site that you can uh, do your thing on, um, but nothing really formal. Anything else? So it turns out YAML is YAML eight markup language. There you go. I knew it was funnier than yet another. YAML eight markup language. So, so given that XML is um, is not a good document format, is not a good data format, mm -hmm. and yet that's the, that's the many, do you think many people are still using it? So um, given that XML is not a good data format and not a good document format, are there people still using it? Yes. Uh, there are a lot of people who are still using it. So, um, so where do we go from here? With a, so JSON is a good data format. And, so, so what's your opinion about a good document format? How are you doing? Do you think we may be able to move into towards uh, um, a better document format? How could we get a better document format? I think we could do well. And I would recommend anybody who might, I don't know, be doing research here or something like that to consider uh, looking at, at um, Reed's work. Um, and seeing it, a 21st century version of Scribe, what would that be like? Could we generalize those ideas and do something really powerful? Keeping the idea of an extremely simple syntax, something that will not confuse people, but which still gives them enough expressive power to do the kind of things we want. SGML turned out not to be that language. I think uh, stepping back 30 years, I think we have a better chance of getting it right. Do you mean that we cannot get it right anymore because we already have this huge amount of... We'll never get, we'll never get XML right. We're, it is what it is. And I can rev the, the version numbers, but it, it's always going to be what it is. Yeah? Uh, so I've used XML to do parsing, looking forward, and just extracting a specific piece of information. It's not necessarily the whole object, it's just probably some fill in somewhere in the text that I don't care where it is, possibly maybe looking for errors or something. How would JSON be used otherwise? Do we have to parse the data all the same day, or what's the advantage um, in those kind of situations? JSON's fast enough, you just go and parse the whole thing and, and get what you want out of it. Um, I, I don't want to tell you how to, to do big things. If it's a crazy thing that doesn't work in JSON, then you know maybe crazy applications are what XML is for. That's what I'm trying to get to is with large documents and the sort of operation that I sh described, do you think still parsing the whole document into an object and uh, then trying to extract I would go back to your assumptions. Why do you have large documents that you have to do this needle in a haystack stuff on it? Maybe, maybe there's a smarter representation you should be doing. Maybe you're you're approaching the problem incorrectly. I, I don't know. I don't understand your problem, but it, it doesn't make sense to me. Okay. So uh, let's move on to the web of confusion. Um, so the cross-site scripting attack was invented in 1995. And we have made no progress on the fundamental problems that enabled that attack since then. Um, so that causes me to ask a question, will the web ever reach the threshold of good enoughness when we are not constantly under subject to these attacks? Um, on, on the, a, a positive answer would be that as we discover vulnerabilities, uh, that will lead to corrections. And we have been discovering vulnerabilities for the last decade or two, um, but that doesn't seem to be converging on anything. Um, you would think that um, the rate at as we correct vulnerabilities, that will introduce new vulnerabilities, because at, at, hopefully at a slower rate, 
but you would still hope eventually to converge onto something that's going to be good enough. On the other hand, we're at adding lots of new features to the browsers, and adding new features tends to introduce new vulnerabilities and unintended consequences. And right now, the HTML5 thing is out of control, and we're getting a lot of new stuff coming into the browsers, most of which has not been thought through very well, nothing of which has been formally vetted. Um, so that might make people anxious that maybe we're making things even worse. But I think the key th answer is that if the fundamental assumptions are faulty, incremental correction never converges on good enoughness. And I think that's where we are. That's why we've made no progress on fixing the browser since its introduction, even though we've been patching it pretty aggressively ever since. What we are doing is creating a ever-growing corpus of hazards. Um, so we now have a very detailed list of things that you need to avoid doing in order to avoid uh, compromising your applications. But it's unreasonable to expect web developers to understand all of this stuff. There's just way too much. Uh, perfect knowledge is not an option here. Um, it's just unreasonable to expect developers to understand enough of that corpus in order to be effective at protecting their applications. So that leads to another question, is the web too big to fail? That's a, a popular meme these days. Um, and there are some technologies that are hoping uh, that it's not. Um, so we see Flash and Silverlight and JavaFX and other things that are hoping to displace the web. Um, you know, can they do that? Um, can they displace the web? And the web is obviously deficient on many dimensions. It, it would appear to be vulnerable. Uh, but I contend that the web got closer, despite its obvious failings, to getting it right than everything else. It got it better right than everything else. And I hope to demonstrate what that was. But first, let's review what went wrong. So there are a lot of ways things go goes wrong. The standard one is we'll add security in 2.0. That doesn't work. And you would think people would know that by now, but they keep doing it over and over again. You get architects and, and developers who think that the hard part is getting the system cycling or getting the pixels on the screen or getting the bits across the wire. And once we get that hard part done, then we'll do the easy thing of securing it. And that, turns out not to be the hard part. Um, security is part of the itty bitty itty committee, uh, including quality, modularity, reliability, maintainability. These are things that you can't add. You can't add a quality component to something. You can't, to make it better quality, you can't add a modularity module to something to make it modular. You know? <laughs> and it's the same for security. You can't add a security box and make things secure. We've seen lots of attempts at doing that, and they have all failed. The way you make something secure is by removing the insecurity, which is a different thing. Um, we see confusion of cryptography and security. Um, a few years ago, I was attending a conference called the Digital Living Room in San Mateo, where Hollywood meets Silicon Valley. Um, and there was a group there called DLNA that was trying to promote an architecture in which you could have things in your house all talking to each other. You know, like the TV could talk to the computer, could talk to the VCR and, and everything else. So you could have one remote control and each of the devices could route the signals around and, and make everything wonderful, which was nice. But I went to uh, one of the CTOs of, of one of the companies doing that stuff and, said, and I told him, you've made it possible for an attacker to get into the computer and now take over the home network. You know, so he can now change the channels. He can turn the TV on and off. He can make you watch porn. He can make you watch ads. He can track everything that you're watching. Uh, um, you can have one device launch a denial of service attack against another device. So everything that people have learned to hate about their computers, you're now making possible um, on the TV. And his answer was, well, nobody would do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad you laughed. Um, so then he, I, I convinced him that people would do that. Um, if only because you can't prevent it, there are people who will do it. Um, but unfortunately, there are even worse motivations than that. Um, so he suggested, well, maybe we could have the devices authenticate themselves to each other. And we, so you know, if just add some crypto to it, we'll somehow make it safe. And I explained to him why that wouldn't work. And he said, well, eventually, he was confident that they would figure it out. First, they wanted to ship it. Um, we see a lot of confusion of identity and authority, that if we know who wrote the software, that's enough to know that what the software ought to do. That, that clearly doesn't work. We see a lot of blame the victim stuff. 
where you have a system which is unable to make good decisions as to what it should allow and what it shouldn't. And so it says, let's ask the user, but it always asks the user in a way that the user cannot possibly answer correctly. Um, th this just doesn't work, but we still see an awful lot of this. Um, but ultimately, I think the most fundamental thing is the confusion of interest. Um, and let me talk about what I mean by that. So if we go back to the beginning of computing, go back to the 40s and 50s where computers were first coming on, into existence. You had a box, you would put a program in the box, the program would run. Whose interest does, is represented there? Well, generally the person who's writing the programs is employed by the same guy who owns the machine and so we're all in it together. So that's pretty easy. Um, but as um, the number of people who are using the machine increases and as um, uh, things like storage become available, uh, which is persistent across user sessions, then it becomes much more uh, of a question. Um, early on it was discovered that um, the system needed to protect itself from the programs that it was running. And so we had the invention of user mode. And this turned out to be a really good idea and, and continues to be a standard feature of CPUs. Um, so, you know, we don't trust this guy fully, we trust this guy fully, we don't want that one to mess with that one. That turns out to be a good thing, but ultimately, ultimately not sufficient. Um, and, and it became really obvious when we entered the time-sharing era. When we now have multiple users in the machine at the same time, we do not want each of the users to be able to tamper with each other. So the idea of having a separate process, and the processes are opaque, opaque to each other, so one user can't mess with another, that turns out to be a good thing except that um, sometimes the users want to cooperate. Maybe they have a collaborative application in this process model, there's no way for them to do that. But even worse, um, there's confusion within each of these processes about whose interest is being represented. So if I'm a malicious user and I want to get at that guy's account, I can't get at it directly. Um, so we have enough protection to do that. What I have to do is trick him into running my program. Because when my program runs in his account, there's a confusion of interest, and the system assumes that my program is representing his interest. And so I get access to his files, and I can do bad things to him. In the time-sharing era, they were just beginning to wrestle with that question and realize, whoops, we've had this wrong from the very beginning. What are we going to do about that? And we started to see some really interesting research on that. And then it all fell apart um, because of the personal computer. The personal computer destroyed the economics of software as a service or computing as a service. So we went all the way back to bare metal. Um, and so you've got a program which is indistinguishable from the machine. Um, and that gets bad when we, and it works very well at first and gets worse as we add hard disks and floppy disks. Floppy disks become the medium of exchange for propagating viruses and when we add modems and networks to it it gets much worse. So we have basically all the problems that we had in the mainframe era, but none of the protection. Um, so the system cannot distinguish the, uh, between the interests of the user and the interest of the program. This kind of worked okay when you had a lot of friction in, involved in the process of installing new software. So the, it generally required the user pay some money in order to get a program. Um, it, it, failed when software came with viruses preloaded. That, that was a, a worry for a while back in the uh, box software era. Uh, but it changes now in, in the network era. Uh, so this is an important quote. It is not unusual for the purpose or use or scope of software to change over its life. Rarely are the security properties of software systems re-examined in the context of new or evolving missions. This leads to insecure systems. The person who said that was me. I just want to go on record as having said that. <laughs> so practices that worked in another time don't work when you go forward and change the, uh, the, the circumstances around it. So on the web, we have casual, promiscuous, automatic, unintentional installation of programs. Um, and it works because the interests of the user and the program are distinguished. Um, so the web has gotten something right that nobody ever got right before, in which other venues continue to get wrong. That the, the web browser does not confuse the interests of the user and the program that the user is running. Uh, the 
browser su successfully distinguishes those interests. Um, what it confuses is the interests of the multiple sites. Um, this was something that was not anticipated when the browser was put together. Um, in, in fact, when Netscape 2 introduced frame sets and JavaScript at the same time, um, they very quickly discovered, oops, um, it was now possible for the sites to contaminate each other. Yeah? For pop-up walkers, sort of, uh, just a counter-example, brief statement. The web was running code. The code was doing something that I didn't want. My computer was just to pop open the new window. Uh, yeah, that was a case of, uh, of excessive authority being granted, and that's generally been corrected now. So it's been a long road uh, to correcting this, but still the, the browser comes closer to getting it right than anything else. Um, So where the browser is most wrong now is that within a page, the interests are confused. Um, so if an ad or a widget or an AJAX library gets onto a page, it gets exactly the same rights as the site's own scripts. Um, and so they get all the since they get all the capability the site has, they can do anything the site can do, including communicating back to the site. The site cannot determine uh, whose interest is being represented in that request. Um, so one thing that complicates this is what I call the turducken problem. Um, this is a, a map of, of the browser, so, or of the languages of the browser, a concept map. So a turducken is uh, a, a, a turkey that's stuffed with a duck that's stuck with a chicken. Um, so th there's a lot of stuff being nested in there, and the web works the same way. So you've got HTTP, which holds HTML, which can hold URLs, which can hold JavaScript, which can hold styles, which can hold more URLs, more styles, more scripts, so on. You can nest these things really deeply, and it gets really complicated. Um, and so it's very difficult uh, to analyze a piece of text and be confident that you are not accidentally or unintentionally injecting a piece of script into a page which is a problem because if that script gets on the page, it gets all of the capabilities of that page and can, can cause significant harm. This is not a Web 2.0 problem. This has been in the web since 1995. All of this came since with Netscape 2 and has not gotten any better since then. Well, it's slightly better. Uh, we have pop-up uh, pop, pop blockers now. A few things have improved, but for the most part, uh, we're back where we started. Except now we're mashing things up. For a long time, there's been interest in being able to uh, take components from, from different places, stick them together like Lego, and build applications really quickly and easily, having the powerful capabilities of these things combined. Um, and it's incredibly surprising that the browser is the place where this actually works. Um, JavaScript is the language which is enabling this. Um, and so it's not only theoretically possible now, it is it is deliverable now. You can send it to billions of people, which is a wonderful thing. Um, except that a mashup is a self-inflicted cross-site scripting attack. Because each of the components in the mashup now gets everything that's available to all of the components. Um, and what makes it even worse is that advertising is a mashup. And advertising is the thing which is paying most of the freight now for the internet. Um, so any time an ad goes onto a page, that advertiser, in exchange for um, his, whatever he's paying for his impression, is also getting the right to um, attack the site, steal the user's credentials, um, whatever he wants to do. There's nothing the site can do to prevent him from doing whatever he wants to do, which is a bad thing. So in my view, we need to correct this before the House of Cards falls apart. Um, so. JavaScript is very much maligned in, in this stuff. We're constantly reading reports about another thing that's wrong with JavaScript. But JavaScript actually gets closer to getting this stuff right, I think, than virtually any other programming language in operation right now. Um, what, because JavaScript got so close to getting it right, a secure dialect is obtainable. And there are uh, projects like AdSafe, Kaha, uh, the Web Sandbox, that are leading the way, showing us how to do this. Um, what all these things have in common is a new security model. It's actually an old security model, um, the object capability model. Uh, I highly recommend Mark Miller's robust composition. 
Um, he, he wrote it at, uh, where was he? John Hopkins. John Hopkins. Uh, re really good read. Um, so one of the things that we get from that model is cooperation under mutual suspicion, which means that each of the interests can be kept separately, uh, but they can still interact with each other, which is exactly the, the property that we need in order to do mashups, and also in order to insulate ourselves from cross-site scripting attacks. Um, so let me uh, quickly go through what object capabilities are. So we'll start with objects. Um, here A is an object. Like any object, it has some state and behavior. And we have um, a has a relationship between object A and B. All that means is that object A contains a reference to object B. Um, having that reference, A can now communicate with B. It can send it messages or call its methods, whatever the language allows. Um, and B has an interface that constrains what A can do to it. So A cannot get at B's private state. A can only send it messages through its public interface. Um, here, A does not have a reference to C. So A is fundamentally incapable of communicating with C. It's almost as if C has a firewall around it. A simply cannot communicate with it until it gets to that reference. There's nothing new here. This is just the way object systems are supposed to work. So an object capability system is produced by constraining the ways that references are obtained. A reference cannot be obtained simply by knowing the name of a global variable or a public class. In fact, there should be exactly three ways to obtain a reference, by creation, by construction, and by introduction. So by creation means that if a, if a function or a method <clears throat> creates an object, it gets a reference to that object. Wouldn't make sense otherwise. Um, number two is by construction. An object may be endowed by its constructor with references. And these could include references in the constructor's context and inherited references that it wants the instance to get. And three, the most important, is by introduction. So here we have A, which has references to B and C. B has no references, so it can't communicate with anybody. Same with C. A decides it's to its advantage for B to be able to communicate with C. So it sends B a message. And that message contains a reference to C. And once that message is delivered, B now has the capability to communicate with C. That's why this is called a capability model. If references can only be obtained by creation, construction, or introduction, then you may have a safe system. And if references can be obtained in any other way, you do not have a safe system. Um, so there are some potential weaknesses uh, to avoid. Irrigation, corruption, confusion, and collusion. Irrigation means to take or claim for oneself without right. And this would include global variables, public static variables, um, standard libraries that grant powerful capabilities like access to the file system or the network or the operating system to all programs. Um, any language that allows address generation obviously uh, tolerates irrigation. Um, JavaScript's global object gives powerful capabilities to every object. This is the thing that JavaScript got wrong. And this is what um, Kaha and AdSafe and Web Sandbox spend most of their energy trying to prevent. Um, by removing the global object from the programming model, a safe language is obtained. Um, corruption. It should not be possible to tamper with or circumvent the system or other objects. Um, confusion. It should be possible to create, or one, one thing on this, we're in ECMAScript 5th uh, edition, we're adding new facilities to JavaScript, which uh, allow us to make this statement true for JavaScript. So we'll have um, object hardening uh, techniques, which allow you to make an object which becomes impervious, that you could then hand to uh, sus suspect code and be confident that it cannot damage the object. Uh, ask me later. Um, confusion. It should be possible to create objects that are not subject to confusion because a confused object can be tricked into misusing its capabilities. And finally, collusion. It must be possible, it must not be possible for two objects to communicate until they are formally introduced. If two independent objects can collude, they might be able to pool their capabilities and cause harm. Um, one of the things we get from the capability model is rights attenuation. 
some capabilities are too dangerous to give to guest code. So we can instead give those capabilities to an intermediate object that will constrain their power. Um, so I'll, I'll show you in a moment an example of how we do that. Ultimately, every object should be given exactly the capabilities that it needs to do its work. Capability should be granted on a need-to-do basis. So where you used to think about information hiding, you now think about capability hiding. Um, intermediate objects or facets um, can be very lightweight, and class-free languages like JavaScript are especially effective at implementing these. So um, here we have a facet that's going to be um, limiting a guest object's access to a dangerous object. So the guest doesn't have a reference to the dangerous object, it has a reference to the facet. Um, the facet sits in between them, can monitor all the traffic going back and forth, and, and attenuate whatever powers uh, should be granted to the guest. Um, one of the uh, complaints about the capability model is that references are not revocable. Once I give a reference to an object, I can't ask it to forget that reference. Well, I could ask it, but I can't depend on it obeying. So I have to assume that once I give out a capability, that, that capability is granted forever. Um, and some people think that is evidence that the capability model can't work. But it turns out using facets, um, that's easily gotten around. So here I've got a guest which will make a request to an agency object for a capability to interact with the dangerous object. And what it gets instead is a facet, a reference to a facet, um, which will uh, mediate as before. But the agency retains um, a capability to the facet. And at the time that the agency decides it wants to revoke the capability, it sends a message to the facet saying, go inert. And the facet does that by simply forgetting its reference. So the guest still has a reference to the facet. We can't revoke that, but the facet is now uh, not useful to him. And so effectively we have revoked it. Um, we can also have a facet mark requests so that a dangerous object can know where the requests came from. This allows us to do tracking and accountability. So facets are great. They're very expressive, they're easy to construct, they're lightweight, they allow us to do uh, power reduction or attenuation. Uh, they allow us to have a form of revocation. We can do notification, delegation, quite a lot of powerful patterns that come out of a really simple pattern. It turns out the best object-oriented programming patterns are capability patterns. When we found that when we're um, designing uh, just programs in general and we're faced with one of these things where you could structure something this way or that way, which is the right one, you know, that struggle, asking which of those makes the most sense as a capability pattern, you always pick the right one. It's amazing. Um, so it turns out good object design good object capability design is good object-oriented design. Um, the DOM, unfortunately, got much less close to getting it right. Um, but the AJAX libraries are converging on a much better API, which is good. But ultimately, I think we're going to need to replace the DOM with something that's more portable, more rational, more modular, and safer. We need to replace the DOM with something that's less complicated, less exceptional, and far less grotesque. W3C, I think, is moving in the opposite direction. Um, so I'm thinking that um, HTML5 needs to be reset, or I think W3C needs to be abolished, and we need to figure out another way to get this done. Um, so the advertising problem is, is serious. Um, we found that it's difficult to go to the advertisers because the threat is that they'll pull their money out and take it to someone else. But everybody else, they might give it to is equally at threat. Um, so we need to do this together. Everybody who's in this business needs to go together to the advertising industry and say, we need to fix this. We need to put controls on ad quality in order to protect um, all of our interests, including theirs. Um, one technology which could help to do that is something I've been working on called AdSafe. It takes the capability model um, and takes a minimal approach to applying it to um, the protection of advertising. Um, AdSafe is a JavaScript subset that adds capability discipline by deleting features that cause capability leakage. Um, and it does it statically, so there's no runtime performance uh, penalty. 
Um, the, the language um, is very much constrained. For example, you can't use the this variable and use of um, some other things are, are greatly restricted. Probably the most annoying thing in the language is that you can't use the subscript operator. You have to use methods instead to, to pull things out of an array. Um, but AdSafe relies entirely on static validation. So it does not um, modify the code in your widget, which means that debugging is much easier um, because you're debugging the original code. You're not debugging something that's been transformed. There's no performance penalty. Validation can be done at every step in the ad pipeline from the creation of the creative all the way to post-consumer, uh, post-mortem analysis. Uh, currently, the, um, uh, the validator is implemented in JSLint, which is a code quality tool for JavaScript. So you get an extra bonus that um, your code will be clean when you get it through as well. Um, and, uh, one, of the, one of the bad things about AdSafe is it's extremely unlikely, I'd say virtually impossible, that any existing code would run, be approved by AdSafe without modification. Uh, for one thing, there are very dangerous and popular practices that are not allowed. For example, document.write, which is used abusively by the advertising industry. Um, also, AdSafe cannot protect the widget from the page. It, it can only protect the page from the widget. Um, so in the case where you've got evil website operators, um, AdSafe will not, by itself, will not be a sufficient mechanism. Although perhaps AdSafe with ad frames or other mechanisms might. <clears throat> AdSafe also provides a DOM interface. One that's lightweight, query oriented, um, and it scopes the queries to be strictly limited <clears throat> to the contents of the widgets div so that guest code cannot get access to um, any individual DOM node. That's important because in the DOM, every node is linked to every other node, which is linked to the document, which gives you the capability to go to the network. And once you get to the network, you can send data to any machine in the world, and you can receive additional scripts from any computer in the world. So that's a dangerous capability that we don't want to give to ads. Um, this is an example of a widget just to show what the, the pattern is. It's not a complicated template. You just plug your code in it. Um, I think we've gone as far as we can on, on luck and good intentions. Um, I think at very long last, we need to get it right. We've not done much in the last 15 years to do that, but I, I think now we can. So thank you and good night. So we, we have some time for questions. Yes? So what are the, the sort of the market forces do you think that are going to push us towards this safer world? I mean, I agree that you know, JavaScript and HTML5, they're just a big mess, right? They, they just, they, I can't sleep at night because of this kind of stuff. But I think the problem is, is that so JavaScript has a lot of ugly features because it allows it, it, it's very easy to write stuff very quickly and without a lot of discipline. Right? We all know that most web programs are not visible. And I think the HTML spec is exploding is because people think it's awesome that I can embed you know, video. And, like That's what's driving me. This is awesome. I want this feature. And I would argue that to a certain extent, people accept the fact that there will be security vulnerabilities, there will be this sort of patch cycle, and people, and we're sort of the market, it's sort of willing to pay that price for these new features. So I guess I'm wondering, you know, if you have this more restrictive, you know, ad safe language or whatnot, it seems like some of the whiz bang features that make web 8.0 applications awesome are not going to be as easy to do. So what is it in the market that's going to make us move towards this safe world? Yeah, I, I completely agree um, with the points that you made. Um, what would I do? Well, that's why I'm here. Um, the, the, the way in which we create web standards, that whole process is totally broken. Um, and I don't have a lot of confidence that it's going to get fixed. So somehow we need to get above all of that noise and work collectively somehow to find a better way forward. Um, and I, I think the place to start is with the advertising network because we all have a huge investment in keeping that system alive. And I, I think it, it's teetering and, and we can't afford to have it fail. It, it's all that my company is. It's becoming an increasingly important part of your company and a lot of other companies. And so right now the, the circus is being run by the browser makers. And 
we can't tolerate that anymore. We, we need to take it over somehow. Um, so I'm here to uh, try to create some consensus around the idea that we need to find some other path forward because the current one certainly isn't working. Is you mean the standardization or? Yeah, the W3 process has never been responsive to our problems and is just getting worse. It's out of control. Are others about guided by the W3? No, they, they are actually driving it now. It is the browser makers who are. Um, W3C has lost control of its own process. So you want to control by the advert, by. You want to take away control from the browser developers and move them into a group. So who should have control? Me. <laughs> <laughs> It may be someone else, someone I like, but I haven't seen it yet. Yes? So what is the adoption story for it, say, for their advertisers who use it? Is it uh, uh, no, currently, ethical at this point? Currently, there is one person in the world who is using AdSafe. And that is uh, Tyler Close at HP Labs is doing some really interesting research using AdSafe as a delivery mechanism. Um, so no, the, the advertisers are not using it yet. No one is using What's the main it. Why not? Because they don't have to. Well, one of the reasons <clears throat> why the <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> one of the reasons why the market forces aren't working here <clears throat> is that um, the economic incentives flow in the wrong direction. So the advertisers uh, many years ago, um, after a lot of struggling and a lot of fraud and a lot of bad stuff, um, settled on a standard way of doing things, and then fossilized. And, and so since for, for 10 years there's been no progress in the way that ads get created. Um, and so as our applications get increasingly sophisticated and as we're getting more mashup-y and all this stuff, assumptions that were made 10 years ago are no longer holding. You know, it's like I said before, as things change, uh, old things no longer are as safe as they had been. Um, and so you would like to be able to say, hold it, Mr. Advertiser, I just can't accept your thing anymore. He says, I'll give you some money. Go, oh, okay. Uh, so be because basically they're paying us to look the other way. Um, would we have this strong sense that we will never allow any third party to put anything on our site which causes um, any compromise of the safety or security of any of our customers or ourselves unless someone can meet our minimum CPMs. And it's not just us, it's everybody. Everybody's doing that. Um, and because, you know, it, it's all business it's, and it's important that the money keep flowing and so we need to do this in a way which doesn't disrupt that. We're trying to do this in a way which ensures that it can go forward. And that's, we're in this bad spiral and we need to correct it somehow. Do you see any light in this space? Or is it really going to be sacred cow that should not be uh, sacrificed by uh, I, I wouldn't be talking about this if I didn't think we could make it better. So um, while all of this sounds kind of bad, my real message is that we have the technology to fix this stuff. We have the theory to fix this stuff. Um, I don't think it's going to be all that difficult to apply it. We just need the will. And that's the thing we're lacking at this point. If we can find the will to correct all of our systems, to correct all of our sites, we can make things better for everybody. We can reduce the fraud, we can reduce the uncertainty, we can make it better. It's worth doing. Yeah. Uh, in one of your slides, as part of doing the capability model for security, you suggested to remove uh, argument that Kali mm -hmm. or its use. Uh, or similar functions that allow us to access the uh, stack or other things. What would uh, you provide as a substitute which allows us to be more flexible, have that functionality, but also be safe? Because it seems like it's more limiting the language and it may limit its use. Um, it's my feeling that a, a program has no business looking at the stack. That, that's not a capability it, it should be entitled to have. 
uh, debugger is a different thing, and um, there are different affordances for that. I, I don't think that needs to be given to every application. The big use of the call stack is, uh, um, is so we could do bug tracking. Um, the big problem in the client side web is, is if something fails, I mean, you know what Watson is on Windows? You have web version of that, which is going to do a dump of the stack. Uh, at least in Windows Live, it removes all PI information before we pull the information back to the server. And that is where it's actually quite useful, because it's actually how we improve the stability across our network. Uh, by magnitude, by being able to dump that debug. All right, so one mechanism I'd like to see in the browsers would be some kind of module container. Iframes I come close to it, but, but they're not good enough. But something where I can put some code in there and give that code the capabilities it needs, and I know that it cannot attack any other frame or any other module. And such a, a thing should have the capability of sending its own stack back to its own site. I, I can see that as being a reasonable capability for it to have. But that's not something that I want any piece of code to be able to do. That's pretty dangerous. If you gave... Allow an application to send its own stack back to its own server. I, I don't think that's dangerous. You can figure that out without the stack. Yeah. I'm curious to what your opinion is of Facebook's dialect of JavaScript. In what way is it solving the same problems as AdSafe? And likewise, how is it is going about it differently? Or yeah, so you're asking about FBJS. Mm -hmm. So there's some very good work done in FBJS. Um, and it's attempting to solve a very similar problem. Um, Facebook has decided to abandon that. So uh, they're not going forward with that. They'll probably be adopt adopting one of the others, I would expect. Uh, probably Kaha, since that seems to be the most popular at the moment. Yeah. So if you were to ask a major browser manufacturer to add one thing that they're currently not maybe planning to do anyway, what would it be? It would be a module. Um, you know, modules are so important in software systems. And we've known that for, what, 30 years at least? Maybe, no, 50 years. It, they're essential. And the browser doesn't have any kind of module. There's no good way of making a big thing out of a bunch of little things and putting a membrane around them and, and protecting it. Um, so if I could have only one thing, it would be that. The stuff that Google's been doing with Gears, um, I think, is a step in the right direction. I like that they've got workers and other things which each exist in their own process, which are then able to communicate. Um, I, I like that. I'd, I'd like to see us moving more in that kind of direction. The thing you cannot touch DOM, right? Those worker plans in Google Gear. Uh, right, they can't touch any DOM. So ultimately what we want is to be able to give each of those things its own rectangle and say, you can draw in your rectangle, but you can't go anyplace else. We, mm -hmm. Currently, we don't have any way to specify that. Actually, our proposal is very close to Yeah, I, I don't claim any originality in, in the stuff that I'm saying. I'm just describing what I think the solutions are. Yeah. Have you dealt with anything like as far as validating JSON structures beyond just syntax correctness? Because one of the arguments I get for XML is we want to be able to validate this config file and somehow give you like a schema or something you can validate it and display to the user, oh, you have an offset here. This, Character is wrong. Yeah, when I started uh, publishing the, the JSON stuff, when, when Ajax became popular, I, I designed a schema system for JSON. And I found there were sort of two classes of people. There were people in the XML, XML world who didn't want to use JSON, who were looking for excuses. And then there were people from the XML, XML world who had made the transition to JSON who didn't need it. Um, and so I decided not to implement it. Uh, other people have gone ahead and, and done stuff, like uh, Chris Zeip at Dojo has done some very good work on, on schemas for JSON. Um, I'm, I don't like the idea of using schema to do validation um, just because I think it delegates too much responsibility for correctness to something which doesn't have enough information to do it well. 
Ultimately, every application needs to be responsible for verifying its own inputs because only it has the knowledge and the context to understand what all the data means and how it interrelates. Um, and I, I think one of the bad contributions of the XML schema model was that you don't need to do any of that stuff. It's all done for you. And that turns out to be uh, fraudulent. I, I don't think that really works. I think we have time for one more. Anybody? Yeah. Uh, so we have a slide where um, you, you showed with, like a classifier, and there are other like, ones like commission records as well. And there's been um, some pushback from at least the project community um, for patterns like that for performance reasons. Um, and you claim that's uh, as it does zero performance overnight, um, which is also something to do. Um, so uh, in general, like this capability style, General like capability program programming gives you a threat model, but to actually mitigate those threats, you, you start using these runtime patterns. And what I'm wondering is, what are your thoughts about the performance of these things? Uh, performance of these things is really good. Um, we had tried doing this stuff in Java, and we found because of the way the class model worked that basically we'd have a different class for every facet, and that turned out to be horrendously expensive. But working in JavaScript, most facets turn out to be a single function. And functions are really lightweight in JavaScript. And adding an extra function into a, 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 a call path to something is in the noise. Um, so we found it was a really good trade-off. JavaScript is. Uh, only for the ones that cross a trust boundary. Thank you for the great talks and the great discussion, Doug. Okay, thank you.